Amen. Thank you, Catherine, for that special music. Catherine and I are pretty lonely up here. There's nobody else up here. It's just the two of us. And uh, I told her earlier, it felt like back when we were doing the COVID shutdown, and we were the only two people up here. Terry was in the back, and we were in an empty room. It feels kind of lonesome, but we're glad you're here, and you guys are doing great this morning. It's good to see everybody here in worship today. Today, I want to talk to you about the great reward, and I invite us to hear these words from Luke chapter 6, verses 27 through 38. Jesus says, but I say to you that listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you, and if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies, do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High. For He is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. A little girl sat down to eat her lunch one day. There was a fine peanut butter jelly sandwich and a glass of milk there on the table waiting for her, but she didn't touch any of it. A little while later, she went to her mother and she said, I don't feel good. And her mother asked what was wrong and she replied, I have a stomach ache. And at that point, the mother looked over and saw the sandwich and milk were still there. And she said, well, honey, your stomach hurts because it's empty. You need to put something in it. Eat your lunch and you'll feel better. Well, about this time, the preacher stopped by their house for a visit. And as they were talking, the preacher began to complain. He said, you know what? I've had this headache all day long. I can't shake it. There's nothing I can do about it. And that's when the little girl looked at the preacher and she said, I know why, Pastor. It's because your head is empty. If you would put something in it, you wouldn't feel so bad. That could be true for us preachers, I don't know. But we all deal with hurts, don't we? Most of us deal with hurts that are worse than a stomach ache or a headache. I think we can all agree today that human beings hurt each other. It's been happening ever since the entrance of sin into the world. We've all been hurt before. Someone uses us. We get skipped over for a promotion at work. A colleague takes credit for our job. A spouse cheats, somebody exploits a friendship for their own gain. Someone that we care for ignores us. A friend talks behind our backs. On the other hand, sometimes we're the ones who are dishing out the hurt, aren't we? We hurt ourselves, we hurt those around us. We look back on many situations with regret. I wish I hadn't said that. I wish I hadn't done that. I could have handled that differently. Why was I so harsh? Why did I hurt them. You know, I don't think anybody ever gets to the end of their life thinking, I wish I would have hurt more people. It's usually the opposite, right? I wish I would have been kinder. Why was I so severe? So many things I wish I could take back. It seems like this is just the the cycle of the world, doesn't it? It seems like this is just how things are going to be forever. Being hurt, hurting others, repeatedly until the end of time. Well, thanks for the pick-me-up, Jack. That makes us feel real good. But is it possible that there's a different way, a way that breaks the cycle, an alternative to the norms of hurt? And if there is a different way, where do we find it? Who is going to show us that way? I submit to you today that Jesus turns this way of hurt upside down. And he's introducing us here to a different way. And as difficult as this passage is to hear, as tough as it is to hear, Jesus is leading us into a better way. 
a better way of living in the world, a better way of being human, a better way of becoming who God wants us to be. Hurt those who hurt you, take revenge, get even, live in judgment of others. That's how the world operates. But Jesus is bringing us into the kingdom of God. He's pulling back the curtain to show us what God is really like and how God operates. Did you know that it is very good news that God does not take revenge on us or that God does not get even with us when we hurt him? God operates in a different way. Jesus says that God is kind to the ungrateful and the selfish and the wicked. That's good news because that's us. God shows his kindness in that even when we hurt him, even when we betray him, even when we live for ourselves, God moves close to us to show us his love and to redeem us. So, as we experience God's salvation today, we begin to live into this new way of life, this new and better way. First of all, we are called here to love our enemies. He begins with the easy stuff first, right? Love your enemies. Now, my first thought when I hear that is I don't have any enemies, so I'm off the hook. I don't have to worry about this at all. I mean, I can't really think of anybody that I'm, you know, in battle with or at war with. But then I stop for a moment and I think about the people that have hurt me before. Sometimes people have talked bad about me to my face, other times behind my back. There are people who have tried to use me and manipulate me, and there are people who have gotten angry with me. That's when I realize, oh, yeah, maybe I do have some enemies out there. And I'll tell you what I do. My response when that kind of stuff happens is generally just to try and ignore when I've been hurt. You know, push it down beneath the surface, try to move past it, don't think about it, don't worry about it. But what counseling and therapy teaches us is that that's not the best way forward. Just trying to to push everything down beneath the surface is not going to make things any better. In fact, it's going to make things worse. Jesus challenges us here to go deeper. We don't want to ignore what happened to us, but on the other hand, we don't want to retaliate and take revenge. But we are called to actually love our enemies. Now, one good way to start this is to begin to pray for your enemies. And that does not mean, God, please strike them down today. God, I hope they have a terrible day today. No, that, that's, a, that's a revenge prayer. I've wanted to pray those kind of prayers before, but it's not really a good idea. That's too easy. Instead, we can ask for God's blessing on them. We ask for God's love to be poured into their hearts. God, would you bless my enemies today? Would you bless so-and-so? Would you bless that person? Would you cover them with your love and your grace? Would you help them to know you better today? Well, Jack, they don't deserve prayers like that. Of course they don't. I don't either. But notice that Jesus doesn't talk about them deserving anything here. He just commands us to love our enemies. Maybe we can also begin to widen our definition of enemies I mean, what about political enemies? Uh, Judging by what I read on Facebook, yes, we have political enemies. We like to, to label the other side as the enemy, as if that just gives us free excuse to, to say all kinds of mean and trashy things about the other side. We, we, we post all these things, and they're, they're hateful, they're mean, just because they're our enemies. Well, let's be clear, the other political party is not our enemy They both love America. They both have different ideas about the best way forward. You can disagree about those ideas. You may think it's not a great way forward. You may think it's a terrible way forward. But we can do that without labeling the other side as the enemy. But I know you're going to love this part. Even if you say they are my enemies, Jack, you're wrong about that. That still doesn't give us license to hate them and be mean to them because of what Jesus says in this text. Jesus says here to love your enemies. There's no way around that. There's no wiggle room there. There's no way to make that say something different than what it says. That means if you're a Republican, 
then Democrats should see you and know you as the most loving Republican that they've ever met. If you're a Democrat, then Republicans should see you and label you as the most loving Democrat that they've ever known. This labeling each other as the enemies has got to stop. It's tearing us apart as a country, and it's numbing our souls. We've got to lower the volume, right? We've got to lower the anger when it comes to politics, or it's going to consume us. Sometimes I'm afraid it already has. We've got to do better. Jesus calls us to a better way forward. Secondly, Jesus calls us to do good here. You know, it's not just enough to to cease from revenge or anger, but we are to be proactive in doing good to those who hate us. What if you saw your enemy at a restaurant and you proceeded to buy their food for them? Or what if you sent flowers to the person who had talked bad about you? Not poison flowers, but real flowers, really nice flowers. What if you heard that they were sick and you brought them a meal and sat with them? Doing good is active. It's something we do. We work for the good of someone else, even if they haven't been working for our good. John Wesley was the founder of the Methodist movement, and uh, he gave these three rules to the Methodist people. And he first commands the people to to do no harm. That means do no evil. Don't, Don't actively hurt or harm anybody else. That's simple enough to understand. But then he commands us to actively do good. He says this, he says, do good of every possible sort, and as far as possible, do good to all people. We can look around at our local church and see people that we don't always agree with or see eye to eye with, but we know they're hurting. We know they're going through a difficult time. Maybe we pick up the phone and we call. Maybe we pay them a visit. Maybe we help to chip in with medical costs or drive them to the doctor. Maybe there are people in our community that we view as our enemies. First of all, stop doing that. But second, how can we be proactive in in reaching out, crossing the divide, and, and building a bridge where it's needed? We can listen to other people's stories, get to know them, we can learn, and then we'll just realize that they're just people. No need to label each other as enemies. Third, in the text, we're called to be merciful. We can be merciful and not judgmental. Did you know that that one of the strongest opinions that younger people have of the church today is that we are too judgmental? And sadly, there's a lot of truth in that. When others look at us, what do they see? Do they see only what we're against? Or do they see what we're for? Do they see only our anger and our rage and the things that we disapprove of? Or do they see our mercy and our compassion towards others? I think it's easy to be judgmental. That's the easy way. I think it's easy to to look down our noses at other people and, and think that we're better than them. We've got it all figured out. They need to get with the program. It's a lot more difficult to be merciful. There was once a middle schooler who got in trouble with one of his teachers one day. He was goofing off in the class, disrupting, trying to get the other guys to to laugh at his dumb jokes. Can you all imagine a middle schooler doing something like that? Well, the teacher finally had enough of this. And uh, by the way, this, this person is me. I'm the middle schooler in this story. Teacher finally got enough of it. She called me outside, and I knew I was done for at this point. That's when my teacher, she said, enough of this. I know your mother. You know I know your mother. You got to stop or I'm going to tell her what you've been doing. I'm not going to do it, but cut it out. And I felt this huge wave of relief fly over me at that point. I mean, that could have gone wrong so quickly. My teacher extended mercy when I didn't deserve any mercy at that point. And I'll tell you, I shaped up pretty quickly after that too. Are we quick to show mercy to people around us. As a pastor, I can tell you that nobody has ever come in my office to complain, so-and-so showed me too much mercy today. It just doesn't happen. Jesus says that God is merciful. He's merciful towards sinners. He's merciful towards us. 
Did you know that God doesn't have to be merciful to us? It's not written in stone that God must be merciful. God could just strike us down with a lightning bolt. God could just snap his fingers and we'd be dust. But instead, God chooses to be merciful and kind. Even to the ungrateful and the selfish. So instead of living like the cutthroat world around us, we can choose mercy too. Mercy to those who have hurt us. Mercy to those who have wronged us. Mercy to those who are out to get us. Mercy to those who give us a hard time. We don't have to respond in retribution. We can respond in kindness. Now listen to some of Paul's words from Romans chapter 12. Paul says, Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Human beings hurt each other. Do we get to hurt them back? Do we get to wrong them back? Jesus and Paul both say no. Hasn't there been enough hurt to go around in this world? Hasn't there been enough hurt in our own lives? We don't overcome hurt with more hurt. We don't overcome evil with more evil. We overcome evil with good. We overcome evil with mercy. We overcome evil by doing to others as we would have them do to us. Of course, we know that that one little verse, verse 31, is called the golden rule. And the, the, the golden rule is fascinating to me. It's very interesting. It's kind of like this little imagination exercise that we do. We think about how we would like to be treated, and then we go and treat others that same way. I want people to treat me with kindness and mercy and grace. So I go out and treat other people with kindness, mercy, and grace. I think about, you know, if I were sick, I would want somebody to, to check up on me and help me out. We go and do likewise. If I experience heartbreak, I would hope that my friends would be there around me to rally around me and support me. We go and do likewise. If I did something dumb, I would hope that my friends would not all leave me and I'd be there on my own. We go and do likewise. The golden rule flows out of our love for God. I mean, it's very countercultural to, to think about others and to treat others the way we would like to be treated. But then we remember how God has already treated us. We remember the kindness and the mercy of God. And I want others to treat me that way, so I have to treat them in that same way. Well, we've made it all the way to the near end of the sermon without talking about the great reward. Think about it. Does, do, do we follow Jesus to get a reward? Do we follow Jesus just to get a treat? Is it like those fun little trinkets that, that I used to get so excited about, those things that would be at the bottom of the cereal box when I was a kid? Hey, this one has a dinosaur. This one has a bendable army man. This one has a race car. How cool. I used to get in trouble for, for trying to get the trinket out of the bottom of the cereal before I had finished the box of cereal. And so my solution to this was on Saturday mornings for Saturday morning cartoons is to try and eat five boxes, five bowls of cereal, and I would finally get down to the bottom of the box and I could get my trinket. Is that what following Jesus is like? Are we trying to get a trinket? Are we trying to get a treat and a reward? No. We follow Jesus because we love him, because he loves us and saves us, but then he promises us a great reward. And did you know that the great reward he promises here is that we will be children of God. We'll be children of God our Father. Sons and daughters of the King. And one day we'll experience that in full, but it begins right here and now in this life. And isn't that deep down what we're all longing for? A place of safety, a place to call home, a family, a God who loves us unconditionally, children of the Most High God. Jesus came to do so much for us. He came to free us from the power of sin, to, to bring us his power 
and he comes to make us into children of God. How amazing. Who are the enemies in your life? Maybe you don't have anybody that you would put in that category, but then you pause for a second and and that old wound from the past comes rising up. That person who wronged you, that thing you still can't let go of, or maybe it's something that's in the present right now. You're dealing with it right now. It's so fresh. The world says that we make people hurt in return for the hurt they've done to us. The world says eye for an eye, vengeance, hate, retaliation. It's so tempting, isn't it? As God's children, Jesus says to us, there's another way. We don't have to retaliate. We don't have to harm others. We don't have to seek revenge. Forgive. Love. Do good. Pray for those who hurt you. Practice mercy and kindness. I wonder if I can do that. I wonder if we can do that. I think I can. I think we can. In fact, I think we'll have plenty of opportunities to practice it this week, right? Maybe then we can bring a little bit of God's healing and a little bit of God's kingdom to our little corner of the world. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we know what you're asking us is <laughs> it's tough, it's hard, it's difficult. But we know that we don't do it by our own power. We don't do it with our own strength. We have your Holy Spirit living inside of us, empowering us, giving us everything we need to love, to forgive, to do good. In a world that has so much hate and evil and violence, Lord, help us to be something different. Help us to represent something different when we're out there each week. Help us to represent you. By showing love, by showing mercy, by practicing forgiveness and praying for our enemies. We know that it won't be easy, but we know that you do not leave us alone, ever. You are always with us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.